Hello, my name is Fadama Brady and I'm the Education Specialist with Down Syndrome Ireland. I would like to welcome you to this presentation, which is part one of three presentations looking at educational programmes for children with a dual diagnosis of Down Syndrome and Autism Spectrum Disorder. This is one of a series of presentations on the topic and it will give an overview of the impact of school and classroom communities. So we'll take a look first of all at the school community. And here we see that relationships within the school communities are the key to making the journey as successful as possible for the child with a dual diagnosis of Down syndrome and autism. So relationships are key. There are six main areas within the school community which will impact on children with a dual diagnosis. We have to look at the school itself, the school leadership, parent expertise, building relationships, team roles and responsibilities, and team communication. All of these will impact on the education of a child with a dual diagnosis of Down syndrome and autism. So let's take a look at each one of these headings. First of all, relating to the school. Most importantly, teachers need to see the child, not just the label. And sometimes parents find that this is very difficult. So from the parents' perspective, this may need some pers persistence on their part. And on other times, it may need additional steps to support the school in seeing the child and not just the label. For parents to have support themselves, they should network with other parents. Maybe network with other parents to find out which teachers are particularly collaborative and open to their suggestions. Parents must remember to always check in with the principal. Very important to do that. It's important for parents and teachers indeed to stay positive and for both parents and teachers to be persistent as they try to achieve the best results for the child. And both parents and teachers should participate in any support groups that are available because the benefits of such groups cannot be overemphasized. Moving on then to look at the second area of school leadership. So for parents, the first relationship you have to build is with the principal of the school. The principal sets the tone for the whole school community. If principals value children with disabilities, then children with Down syndrome and autism will be valued too. If, on the other hand, principals don't take ownership for every child in their school, then they are certainly not modelling their belief for the entire school. However, we need to remember that many principals' hesitancies are founded on fear and on their own uncertainties and not on the possibility of not wanting the child in the school. Building a relationship with the principal is so important. It's crucial that the parent knows the principal and that the principal knows both the parents and the child and understands that this child will actually be a positive force in the school for all children. And as research has shown over and over again, the neighbourhood school, the local school, will be always be ideal to develop a sense of community and a sense of belonging for the child with special needs, for the child with a dual diagnosis of Down syndrome and autism.
parent expertise. The importance of valuing the expertise of parents cannot be overstated. Parents know their children's best and they've had thousands of hours of experience long before the child ever came to school. They know the child's likes and dislikes, their subtle ways of communicating and their obvious ways of communicating. What makes the child smile? What makes the child angry? What makes the child fearful? Or what will calm the child? Information should always be shared between parents and school and school and parents. Parents' insights, recommendations, ideas should always be included in any formal or IEP planning meeting. Parents should also inform the school about their child, who they are in the family, as part of a family, rather than just defining the child in terms of their disability. They need to give the school a picture of the child's strengths and weaknesses, the child's interests and favourite things, their dreams as parents for their child and their vision for their child's future. When we look at building relationships within the school, it is important to remember that special education traditionally comes from the medical model, which is very different from the educational model. As a result, the focus is often on the disability, when ideally we should be thinking of the whole child and bringing the team together that keeps the whole child, not just the disability, at the heart of their work. We need to know when we create learning environments that to focus on the many ways children learn, we are actually enriching the experience for all children. Many teachers feel that they do not have the expertise to work with children with disabilities, such as a dual diagnosis of Down syndrome and autism. But teachers are good instructors and good educators for all children. Good teachers are those who seek answers, who ask questions and who keep learning. All of this effort will enhance all children's success. Teachers also be need, to, need to be asked for their input in relation to the child with special educational needs. To identify the child's strengths as they see them and what they would like the child to learn. Teachers also need to learn how to value the child in their class, to include them in the class and to value any contributions they make. It's also hugely important that teachers encourage the development of friendships in their classroom. Teachers' needs must be supportive and it is so important to ensure that they know how important they are in the child's life. And just finally, teachers' preference for communicating with parents should also be respected. Team roles and responsibilities. It's all too easy to make assumptions as to who will do what. It's important not to make assumptions in this area and to know which team member to approach for key information. Decisions need to be taken about the input of all team members in, for example, developing the IEP, in giving information to parents in ensuring successful curriculum access, in providing the visual supports needed to support the child, in ensuring that the whole team knows how to use the visuals, the strategies and the prompts to help all children achieve success. Decisions must also be taken in relation to who collates the data and reviews the child's progress who organises training for the team 
in relation to the dual diagnosis of Down syndrome and autism. Similarly, all students in the school must be encouraged to create a welcoming, inclusive classroom community, while at the same time learning to value diversity and difference. And finally, team communication. Establishing a communication system with the whole team will help everyone to be and to stay on the same page, the correct page. As a starting point, we should brainstorm to discover what the team needs to know about the child's home and what the family need to know about the school day. A homeschool communication book is useful and key ingredients in an easy to use tick system with a few blanks lead added to add any extra notes that may be needed. Decisions must also be taken on the methods of sharing private confidential data or information between the team members or with the home. The next slide then, after this, will identify some of the key points in relation to the classroom. What does research say about creating successful learning opportunities for students with Down syndrome and autism? Research shows that the potential of children with a dual diagnosis is often hidden and lost because of what assessments don't measure and because the label often gets in the way of people seeing possibility and they then set their expectations to match. So, some key things. Visual supports, schedules, maps are so important because they provide ongoing and consistent information for the students. They provide non-intrusive support and they give the child time to process the information they see. Visuals enhance the communication and the organisation and they promote connections and interactions between students. It's a good idea to enlist the help of the child's typically developing peers in developing visual supports and use the child's interests when developing visual supports to promote the interest and the meaning and the value of the support. Find out which communication systems work. Having multiple modes and ways for students to receive information and to express themselves is critical. So do we use sign language, picture systems, verbal and electronic devices? Which works best? It's best to try out a variety of systems first before investing any money in a particular one. This is another place to enlist the help of typical developing peers in the child's class because they can help the child to learn how to use the system and how to respond. Make sure to get any augmentative communication and assistive technology assessments done promptly to identify functional and relevant tools for the child. This needs to be done early and indeed repeated continuously throughout the school to ensure that the child is getting the appropriate tools. It's important as well for the whole team to learn how to use these tools effectively, so support will be needed there. And consistently follow up and review to make sure that a particular tool remains the best tool a child can have as they grow and learn. Ensure that the curriculum is modified and accommodated for the specific child. It's all about breaking the expectations down into smaller pieces. Once the team learns how to make the modifications and accommodations, 
you will start to see the benefits more than just for the one child, but because every classroom has diverse learners. And we should all remember every day, there is no such thing as a typical classroom. Pay attention to, to positive behaviour support planning. Offering plenty of positive reinforcement and visually enforcing rewards for the behaviours you want to encourage. Use social stories and try video modelling, making videos of desired behaviours and actions to show the child the way to do things. The school staff too need to work together to ensure that the child has natural supports, such as reciprocal friendships and connections with all of their typically developing peers. Team training within the school is very important. And it's a good idea to include parents in any training. Training available should look at best practices, knowledge of the individual's learning styles, how best to work as a team, how to define the adult roles and responsibilities, training in positive behaviour planning, accommodating and differentiating the curriculum, any modifications, and so much more. We should always emphasise the importance of the child learning independent skills, such as self-advocacy and self-monitoring, because we do not want to encourage the development of learned dependencies and learned helplessness. Collecting data and monitoring progress will ensure that the child is growing and developing and that the instruction being provided is producing the results the team desires. Therefore, continuous team planning, problem solving and celebration must be encouraged all the time. On the next two slides, I have listed some very useful websites. These are websites from organization that specialize in looking at autism spectrum disorders and indeed the Down syndrome autism connection and the dual diagnosis of Down syndrome and autism. Similarly on this slide I've listed for you the name of a very very useful book when Down syndrome and autism intersect. This book is relatively recent it was published in 2013 and I've also listed some important articles. Down syndrome and autism spectrum disorder, a look at what we know. More than Down syndrome, the parents view. And dual diagnosis, the importance of diagnosis and treatment. All of these articles are well worth accessing and downloading. On this slide, I have listed for you the other presentations that are available on the Down Syndrome Ireland website. We have a total of five presentations relating to the dual diagnosis of Down Syndrome and Autism. First presentation we have is an overview. Secondly, we have an overview of the language and behaviour of students with Down Syndrome and Autism. And then, as this is part of the series, we have three educational programmes for children with Down syndrome and autism. This one you've just watched is the school and classroom overview. In part two, we will look at inclusive best practice, building friendships and communicating with typical peers and engaging in positive behaviour planning. And in the third presentation, we're going to look at the role of additional adults, the SNA. We're going to look at developing IEPs and we're going to look at making the transition from primary school to post-primary school. On this slide, I have listed contact details for myself, Fidana Brady, and for my colleague, Nicola Hart, who is the head of member support within Down Syndrome Ireland. I have also listed the DSI, the Down Syndrome Ireland website address, and this is where you will access all of these presentations. Finally, I just want to acknowledge 
the fact that the information for this presentation has been taken from the book When Down Syndrome and Autism Intersect. I've mentioned the book already in our resources section. So this book would be hugely useful. I hope you join us for the other four presentations on the dual diagnosis of Down syndrome and autism. In the meantime, bye for now.